is uh, by Dr. Lisa McManus, and she is the our most uh, recent uh, member of the HIMB faculty, and also our most recent uh, marine bio graduate faculty uh, member. So we're really happy to um, have her join us and and to hear about her research and hopefully um, kind of get an introduction to what she works on and and all kinds of um, fun opportunities for collaboration and stuff like that. So I will leave it to you, Lisa, and looking forward to this. Okay. Okay, thanks, Megan. Um, can I just request that if uh, there's questions in the chat during the talk that maybe um, uh, someone could read them out to me just because I don't think I'd be able to see them. No problem. Um, I'm happy to do okay. that. Okay, great. Um, everything look okay. Oops. Where did... We are seeing your desktop right now. And now we're seeing switch, the slide and the screen. presenter notes. I think you need to switch screens. Oh no. <laughs> okay, let me just stop sharing. Do you still see presenter notes? Yes. Sorry. Oh no, okay, sorry. <laughs> sorry, everyone. <laughs> I practiced with Mark and everything. Okay. Okay, one more time. Share screen. Oops. Perfect. Did that work? Yes. Oh, okay. Thank goodness. Okay. Um, yeah, so I just wanted to say uh, thanks uh, to everyone for making me feel very welcome despite our current circumstances. And I'm certainly looking forward to interacting with you all in person um, as soon as we can. So this talk is um, about coral reef eco-evolutionary dynamics uh, and it's work that I completed as part of my postdoc. So before we get started, um, I just would like to uh, go over the kind of general idea behind the project as a whole. So this work was funded by the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation and the Nature Conservancy um, and it was called Modeling Adaptive Potential. And there were two main goals for this project. The first was to um, develop new theory about coral reef adaptation, um, especially in terms of thinking about them as evolving populations. Um, and the second part of this project was to then take those lessons that we learned from, from the modeling approach um, and think of ways to incorporate that into conservation especially for coral reefs. And I'd like to acknowledge um, the contribution of many, many people. Um, so we worked with folks at Rutgers University where I was, the University of Washington, um, also had partners at the Coral Reef Alliance and the Nature Conservancy, um, as well as Stanford and the University of Queensland. So I just wanna point out that this was um, a huge collaborative effort, and I definitely want to acknowledge um, contributions of everyone else. So, uh, <laughs> coral reef scientists, obligatory, uh, nice coral reef photo, right? I mean, this is why um, we do what we do. So, this is a healthy coral reef system um, in the Great Barrier Reef, and of course, there's lots of coral. Uh, they're diverse and structurally complex. Um, You'll notice that there's different uh, types of forms in terms of their, uh, their growth types. And uh, overall, while reefs cover uh, less than 1% of the ocean floor, their complexity provides habitat for uh, about a quarter of all marine life, which uh, those estimates range from hundreds of thousands to millions of species, depending on, on who you talk to. Um, and as we all know, corals are being subjected to a variety of stressors, um, including warming waters due to climate change. Um, and while reefs can recover from bleaching, uh, this prolonged exposure to anomalously high temperatures can lead to mass mortality. And
And of course, without live corals that are actively secreting their calcium carbonate skeletons, um, reefs can end up in a degraded state uh, that is much less structurally complex and can no longer support the same levels of diversity. Um, and so leaching events are happening worldwide. Um, and this graph in particular is a, from a study led by Terry Hughes. Uh, in blue, they show the decrease in the number of unbleached locations through time, as well as increasing number of leaching events uh, in red. So main takeaways here, more and more reefs have experienced at least one bleaching event and that the frequency is increasing, which is particularly distressing because recovery is that much more difficult when bleaching events are back to back. But having said all that, this isn't a doom and gloom talk. And I argue that we are just now starting to uncover the different mechanisms um, by which coral populations can potentially adapt. And so there are many things to consider here in terms of our system. For example, we know that corals disperse and that dispersal affects the local dynamics within a patch. And by that, I mean, um, in any given reef, uh, there's competition, there's herbivory, there's predation, all these local dynamics are occurring. But we know that uh, they also, because of corals life history, that there's dispersal and this dispersal process can influence what's going on at the local scale. Also, we know that reefs experience different temperatures, right? Um, we know that, for example, um, so some sites have average temperature that are warmer or colder, and even um, things like variation in sea surface temperatures can vary widely across the system. And for this and other reasons, we know that corals have different temperature tolerances. So we know that corals can um, differ in their temperature tolerance across reefs. We know that different species may have different temperature tolerances. And even within one particular patch, um, individuals of the same species might have different leaching thresholds. And so uh, this study does a good job of illustrating some of these concepts. So uh, this work was led by Joni Klepis. And what they did was they used historical temperature to calculate bleaching thresholds across the coral triangle. So this is the coral triangle network, um, which is in the Indo-Pacific. And so the assumption here was that populations are adapted to local conditions. They then recalculated these thresholds to incorporate dispersal probabilities from an ocean circulation model. So they simulated a larval dispersal using oceanographic data. And they found that when you incorporate dispersal into your bleaching threshold calculation, um, it can change uh, what those calculated thresholds are. So for example, here, sites in red um, experienced increased bleaching thresholds because those sites were receiving warmer adapted larvae and sites in blue um, were calculated to have decreased bleaching thresholds because they were receiving more cooler adapted larvae. But I just want to point out, so this is um, a, just a dispersal calculation. There was no uh, population dynamics or evolution or any of those processes here. So the key questions I'll be addressing today are uh, basically from three different studies. So uh, one is a very general study. It's um, not, uh, not specifically about coral, but of course you can think about uh, coral, uh, and it's how does dispersal network structure, how do these larval connectivity patterns influence ecoevolutionary dynamics? And in the second piece, we'll be applying this model to uh, real reef systems. So uh, we look at the Coral Triangle, the Caribbean, and the Southwest Pacific, and we ask if we can correlate any reef level factors um, to the probability of a reef either declining or being able to maintain coral cover. And finally, uh, 
This last part is very much ongoing, but we're trying to translate um, some of these findings into being able to inform management decisions. Um, in particular, we've worked closely with folks um, in the Caribbean because they're. this is an ongoing effort there. They're trying to choose um, which sites to protect, basically. Okay, so for this first part. So in nature, many organisms inhabit discrete patches, right? And this can be due to physiological, behavioral, or ecological constraints of the organism. Um, but it can also be due to human-induced fragmentation. And so in these spatially structured populations, dispersal really dictates um, dynamics and persistence. And so I'll be saying the word network a lot throughout this talk. And what I really mean there is these habitat patches that are connected by dispersal. And that system as a whole is what I'd be calling my network or my meta population or even a meta community in some of the applications here. Um, so in certain organisms uh, such as corals or reef fish or flowering plants, we really focus on dispersal that occurs in the early life history stage since that's when these organisms will be traveling the furthest. And so what we're asking in this first study is how this dispersal network structure, how the characteristics of these connections influence dynamics, especially under a changing environment. Okay. So we know from previous studies that the local conditions dictate your response to environmental change. So in this one study, led by Jan Norberg, they had um, a, a meta community. So they had a community along this gradient, right? It was linear, um, organisms moved through a simple diffusion process. And so at the ends here are cooler sites. So that's your, uh, that's poles. And then over here in the middle is uh, equator, right? So then here's your warmer sites. And they found that when you subject the system to increasing temperatures, they found that cold regions were dominated by dispersal. And that's because as temperatures warmed, individuals that were adapted to these warmer patches were able to move to the cooler patches. And that's what dictated um, the resulting community in these cooler patches. However, they found that warm regions were dominated by local selection. And along that same logic, it's because if you were a hot site going through temperature increase, you couldn't rely on these pre-adapted traits that already existed in the network. So in order to survive, these warmer patches could really only rely on local selection. So that previous work, um, had relatively simple dispersal. And there's been a great body of literature that has explored how more complex dispersal affects ecological stability in both populations and communities. So um, in order to um, look at these dynamics, there's usually these two highly simplified dispersal network types. Right, so the first one is a regular network. And in a regular network, you're connected to um, nearest neighbors. So your two nearest neighbors, your four nearest neighbors. Um, while in the random network, you can be connected to patches that are both near and far, right? So you can think about um, this in a linear sense. So in a regular network, for example, you to get from this top patch to this bottom patch, you'd have to go through all of these other patches. Whereas in the random network, you end up with these connectivity shortcuts that can connect very distant sites. And in terms of how the structure affects um, ecological dynamics, we find that in the regular network, um, 
dynamics tend to be more synchronous across patches, whereas in random network, there's more asynchrony. And so we care about this because if you can think about the dynamics, fluctuating dynamics at a single patch, right? Uh, at some point, your abundance might decline there and you might be relying on demographic rescue. So if one of your source sites is also experiencing low abundance, there's less probability of that, right? So that leads to higher extinction risk in regular networks and um, higher persistence in random networks. Right, so just to summarize, we know that local patch environment affects population dynamics. And here we're thinking more in terms of cooler versus warmer patches. And we also know that uh, there's great agreement that random networks lead to greater ecological persistence. And in this paper, we kind of put these two ideas together um, to see what happens, right? First, um, that first piece had very simple dispersal and the second piece doesn't have any environmental heterogeneity. So what happens when we have an environmentally heterogeneous site, but also more complicated dispersal? So we used a system of uh, differential equations. And so at each patch, we're tracking two different things. One is the change in abundance of our organism. And the second is their mean trait value. And here we think about their optimal growth temperature. So I'll say more about that in just a second. But basically, um, the change in abundance at a patch, it depends on growth and mortality. And of course, there'll be individuals that will be incoming into the patch, and that also affects the abundance. And also, I won't be talking much about this, but there's a genetic load term, um, which you can think about uh, a cost for unfavorable traits in the population. So then in that second piece, right, so that first is abundance, and the second piece is the mean trait value. And in our model, the growth and mortality depend on temperature. So in our framework, the population grows, the local population grows the fastest when that trait value is perfectly matched up to the local temperature, right? So then one of the forces that changes this main trait value is selection, right? When there's a mismatch between your mean trait value and the environment, there's going to be a force that will match that up, either an increase or, or a decrease. And then the second thing that can change this trait value is, of course, gene flow, right? You're receiving um, individuals from other patches that are adapted to different conditions. So we need to take uh, that into account when we're tracking this change in mean trait value. In terms of network scale dynamics, we also choose, chose this regular and uh, random configuration. Uh, obviously there's many different random networks, right? So everything I show you will be uh, an average of uh, many different random configurations. But basically each patch is connected to four other patches. So that means they're experiencing dispersal to and from four different patches. And in the regular network, they're dispersing among similar environments. So warm patches are only exchanging uh, individuals with other relatively warm patches. Whereas in the random network, you can be connected to a similar or a very different environment. Uh, and so there's 20 patches, four connections. Um, we first ran uh, the model under constant temperature, but then we imposed this um, increasing climate change scenario uh, where the temperature increased for about 250 years and then we tracked it for uh, another 300 or so years. So the temperature eventually plateaus. Um, two key parameters in the model that we wanted to um, understand the influence of are genetic variance and system openness. So in our work, genetic variance is 
basically equivalent, or we did, we talk about it um, as if it's equivalent to evolutionary potential, right? So when you when you have a system with no genetic variants, you can think of all the individuals as clones of each other. But when there's high genetic variants, um, individuals can be adapted, um, in this case, to a range of different temperatures. And the higher the genetic variance, the more raw material there is for evolution to act in our system. Another aspect is the openness of our system. And we define that um, in terms of how reliant a patch is on other patches in terms of recruitment. So in a perfectly closed system, um, all of our patches are not exchanging larvae uh, with other patches, right? They're basically 20 isolated patches. But in a fully open system, um, that self-recruitment connection is just as strong as the other four external connections. And of course, we tested um, systems that were intermediate in openness as well. Okay, so that was all the model set up and now I'll get into some results. So what I'll be showing is the final relative abundance ratio. Um, so when the box plot is below this dotted, this dashed line, um, that means that random networks led to greater persistence. And when the box plot is above the dashed line, that means that um, regular networks uh, ended up with a higher overall average. Um, and so, this for oh, and this is for uh, three levels of additive genetic variance, and this first result is constant temperature, a fully open system. Okay, so we are able to recreate what the literature says we should find. So when there's no evolutionary potential, when there's no genetic variance, we get that random networks um, led to higher abundance in this system. But then when we increase this added genetic variance, this evolution term, we see this flip, right? So now when we have some evolutionary potential, we see that regular networks end up with higher abundance across the network. And we see a similar pattern for uh, the increasing temperature scenario. Uh, although I do want to mention that um, this result is a little bit less meaningful because um, in our simulations, everything died uh, under the increasing temperature, uh, no evolution scenario. But eventually we do get the same flip um, pattern where here regular ne or random networks are favored at um, intermediate additive genetic variants, but then we see a flip at that uh, higher level. Okay, so that was the result for what was happening across the entire network of 20 patches, right? But to really understand what's going on there, we need to dig into what's happening um, for each of the patches. So I'll be showing you some time series here. On the top will be relative abundance by patch and the bottom will be mean trait value. And then we'll have regular network results and random network results. Um, and this is of course for a particular set of parameters, um, intermediate genetic variants and a fully open system. But these results are fairly illustrative of um, the dynamics across many, many parameter combinations. Okay, so in the regular network, we kind of see the simultaneous dip. Oh, and again, this is for increasing temperature scenario. So we see a dip across all patches, but then they are all able to recover. In the random network, we see that the cooler or these blue patches are able to maintain uh, the relative abundance Sorry, I was calling it cover, but it, it, it's, it's basically the same thing. Um, but then we see these warmer sites that are declining and they are not able to recover. And so we can see 
what happens. Um, we can then look at what's happening at their trade values. So the faded lines in the back are the actual, are the local temperatures. Um, and you see there's some stochasticity there. But basically we see that in the regular network that across those 20 patches, each site is uh, doing a pretty good job of keeping up with the local temperatures there. Right, and then we end up with a, a pretty, a pretty wide range of temperatures across the network at the end. But then look at what's happening in the random network. Right, we see this very, um, very harsh averaging, averaging towards the colder trade values. And what's happening here, or what we think is happening here, is that. Remember those cold sites in the random network can be connected to very warm sites. And so those sites benefit from those connections, right? And so the abundance at the cold sites um, really increases. And then what then happens next is that they're sending out these cold adapted individuals to the rest of the network, right? So then that's why we see this narrowing um, of trait values across the network, uh, which we've been, um, which we think is this signal of gene swamping, right? So overall, it seems that um, evolutionary potential reverses our theoretical predictions regarding persistence. Um, and Again, this was the previous result, right? That no evolutionary under no evolutionary potential, uh, random networks do better. But then, when there is the potential for evolution, um, regular networks uh, end up with higher abundance. And this seems to be because regular networks facilitate local adaptation. So again, in the previous result, we were able to see that in regular networks each of the patches was able to keep up with the temperature change. Whereas in the random network, uh, we did see some uh, effects of gene swamping where those cold sites uh, were able to increase in abundance because of warm adapted larvae. And overall, we see that network structure and environmental heterogeneity uh, have really interesting interactions uh, and they matter greatly for the overall eco-evolutionary dynamics. Okay, so back to back to the coral. Um, so, right. So in this part, in this paper, we tried to figure out if there were any reef level metrics that could predict um, either the maintenance or decline of coral cover uh, across realistic reef networks. And so, to answer this question, we changed the model a little bit. Um, so to add some response diversity, we now have uh, two different species or functional groups, however you want to think about it. So we had a fast growing coral with a narrow temperature tolerance. So here I have um, their growth rate as a function of the difference between trait value and local temperature. And so uh, we had one coral that had a very narrow temperature but a higher growth rate and the other coral was more slow growing but had a wider tolerance. Um, we also tested again since we don't we don't have very thorough measurements of some of these parameters we need to explore multiple possibilities so we tested um, multiple levels of genetic variance, and we also tested. Um, we also looked at many different uh, temperature and connectivity metrics that are commonly um, looked at. So we looked at. We had three different regions: uh, the Caribbean, Coral Triangle, and Southwest Pacific, and we took connectivity matrices from published studies. So. Um, to generate a connectivity uh, matrix, you simulate ocean circulation and then you release these passive particles and you quantify the connection strength based on the where the particle is released and where it ends up. Um, 
We also tested two different warming scenarios, uh, RCP45 and RCP85. So 8.5 is uh, the business as usual scenario and RCP 4.5 is close to, well, ideally what we would get from uh, the Paris Agreement, for example. Okay, so when we had high genetic variance, um, corals did well across both temperature scenarios. Okay, so here I have results for the Caribbean top is coral cover through time and bottom is um, their trait value as, where, as well as the temperature through time. So there's, there's a little bit, there's a lot going on. So these dashed lines um, represent the RCP 8.5 results. And that's also this one up here with the higher temperature. And right, so here, we see that under both of these scenarios, the population is able to keep up with the temperature increase. And either way, the abundance is maintained. And we see similar results for the other two regions as well. When there's no genetic variance, um, everything dies under both of those scenarios. So, right, we see this steep decline and this is, well, I guess it's from our results seems like it's more extreme in the Caribbean, um, but it, in general, these, uh, these populations uh, exhibit decline. And again, so these are results averaged across the entire network. Um, a number of reefs range from 300 to more than um, 2,000. So one of the more interesting results was that when we had an intermediate level of genetic variance um, under one, so this leads to persistence under RCP 4.5, the less severe scenario, but it leads to a decline under the more severe warming scenario. So that tells us that um, in this intermediate level that there's a strong interaction um, with temperature, right? And again, results are fairly similar across the three regions. And this, I just put this in here to remind all of us that uh, while I'm showing you averages across the entire network, uh, our results are uh, spatial. Right, so we can see um, some reefs doing better than others. Um, and one of the metrics we really focus on um, is minimum cover, because uh, you can imagine that, of course, we also had final abundance or final cover results, but, you know, I mean, it's a bit arbitrary where you end the simulation, right? So minimum cover is uh, a nice way to uh, characterize reef response in this case. So remember, we also had the two different coral species and they certainly responded in very different ways. Um, we saw, for example, fast coral tended to decline very quickly, but was able to recover quickly. Whereas the slow coral species was able to not decline as much, but also didn't really recover as fast. Um, so taken together, it's really both of these species uh, were critical for maintaining cover on a particular reef. Okay, I know there's a lot going on in this figure, um, but so, in order to address that question of uh, reef level factors that predicted uh, persistence or decline, we uh, constructed a general linear model um, to look at different factors. Um, and so some of these included various connectivity measurements, for example, how much self-recruitment, um, uh, how large 
the reef was, what was the change in temperature, and really what I want to focus on uh, are these two. So the orange is, uh, we called it initial sea surface temperature, So, but it's basically more uh, how cool or warm you were relative to the network. And then the other factor uh, that had a strong impact was this destination strength, which is how many in how strong are the incoming connections into the patch um, and so these results are basically the coefficients positive values were uh, positive correlations negative negative correlations um, and then this was under three levels of um, additive genetic variance and so one of the more interesting things so when you have enough evolutionary potential, when you have a lot of genetic variants, these uh, metrics, these characteristics are less and less important. So that was just kind of the point of this figure. Um, and also to highlight a couple of these. So this orange one in the negative uh, means that colder patches did well, right? Because there was a uh, temperature. Um, and then here, um, high destination strength was a strong positive predictor of minimum coral cover. And just for completeness, um, we saw mostly similar factors across the three regions, but um, in the paper we do get into, um, there are some differences and there were different, so even those larval dispersal patterns, those connectivity matrices, they were all generated by different groups. So even in, so despite all of those differences, um, we still see um, a lot of results that we can generalize across the three. But of course, there are also some differences. So first and foremost, I, I do want to point out that evolutionary potential is critical. Um, uh, if there's enough of it, it doesn't, we can, basically ramp up the temperature as much as possible, apparently. But of course, um, that's there, there's also a lot of nuance there. And I think those values were definitely on the higher end, but also not totally unrealistic. Um, and here, uh, higher destination strength. And again, having a relatively cool, uh, being in an environment that's relatively cool uh, tended to predict higher uh, coral cover. Okay, so this last part is very much ongoing. Um, and it's basically we've, uh, again, modified the model um, to test different management strategies across these networks. And I'll go into how we did that. So again, this question was addressing if you have this heterogeneous network of reefs, where should we be directing our efforts? Um, and I say efforts because it could really mean um, a variety of things that I'll get into. Um, so again, it's the same exact framework, except now we have a macroalgal competitor in the system. And the role of this macroalgae was just to serve as a local competitor of corals. So that means that all the larvae or all the algae was doing was uh, it had population dynamics. It wasn't dispersing or um, evolving or responding to the temperature. So it was just there to um, serve as another stressor for the coral, essentially. So when we put in marine protected areas in our system, all we did was we set the algal mortality as higher, right? And so this, you can imagine this means, okay, maybe we uh, protect herbivore populations there, but it can also mean that um, you've managed local nutrient inputs, for example, because higher nutrients can be linked to faster algal growth, for example. So again, that's all we did here. There's just the algae die more or die faster in marine protected areas, um, which of course benefits the corals. 
So some of the strategies we looked like we looked at were um, looking to focus on cold sites, the hottest sites. Um, we had this ideal larvae strategy where we chose sites that were predicted to receive um, warm adapted larvae. Um, we also tested a strategy where um, we looked at this metric called eigenvector centrality, which is a metric that um, where you find major larval sources. And of course, we looked at um, a couple other strategies. We looked at what if we just evenly spaced sites across the network? Um, and what if we chose the most isolated sites that you think, okay, maybe they'll have the highest level of local adaptation, for example. Oh, and we also chose, uh, we also looked at a random uh, site selection strategy. So this is just what it looked like for the Caribbean. So um, for most of the analyses, we chose to protect 30% of the network. And you can see the Caribbean has this strong um, latitudinal gradient. So, uh, but not, but it wasn't as a rule that, um, that all the cold patches were up here, for example. So this is just an example of what that looked like. And again, red sites are MPAs and there's higher algal mortality there. So turns out when you average coral cover across the whole network, it's pretty hard to beat the random strategy. So over here, uh, I have kind of three, three subsets. So one is the entire network. Um, one is when you look at sites that were inside the MPAs that were designated as MPAs and then sites that were not MPAs, right? And so when you look at the network as a whole, uh, see that the random, um, the random strategy seemed to work the best. And then for inside MPAs, the cold and the ID larvae strategies led to the highest abundance. And this makes sense because you're basically, uh, we interpret it as you're doubling down on sites that are predicted to do well anyways, right? But then on the flip side, those sites do, uh, that strategy does poorly for the sites that aren't part of the MPA network. Um, and of course, um, like with all the other results, the amount of genetic variance really matters here. Um, oops. So um, the middle plot is what I had just showed you. Um, we also tested results, um, or we tested um, when there was no genetic variance and when there was um, very high genetic variance, but um, seems to be that just having the random strategy, uh, it, it was basically not, you basically couldn't really beat it. Um, and that doesn't mean, um, you know, just allocate MPAs wherever is easiest, but it, we think it means that you need to focus on protecting a diversity of sites. Um, but before I get into that, right, so evolutionary potential and Less warming are definitely key to survival, but we think the random strategy is doing well because it's protecting sites across a diversity of temperatures, right? So cooler sites from our previous work, we know cooler sites do well because they are primarily getting those um, pre-adapted or warm adapted larvae from other sites. Um, and so that kind of cautions against primarily protecting just climate refugia, because part of the resilience of cooler sites is because those warmer sites exist in the first place. Um, so uh, this work is still very much ongoing. Um, and one of the other um, studies we're doing is looking at the existing network, uh, especially in the Caribbean and trying to see if there are missing types of sites. Um, for example, whether the network has mostly cooler or warmer sites. Um, and so we're testing different um, MPA network expansion strategies. And we're also 
testing different restoration strategies, um, which when we're looking at these networks and these reef patches are very, very large, right? I think in the Coral Triangle, the average reef there is several hundred kilometers. So it seems that restoration to affect the entire network needs to be done at such a scale that is not really that feasible at this point. But of course, that's not saying anything about the local effects of restoration. Um, I'm going to end with just some final thoughts and some of the future directions I've been thinking about. So obviously in everything I showed you today, genetic variance has been the critical driver of whether reefs persist or not. And there, there are just not enough empirical measurements of this in corals that, and I mean, you can imagine it would be species specific and it would depend on where the reef is. And I think it's just, so it just points to that this measurement will be critical in order to link these type of simulations to the real world. And also, I mean, as, as mathematically interesting uh, as these systems are, and we have so much more work to do, um, I think it's important to take the mathematical frameworks we have and try to validate them as much as possible. This, these questions of eco-evolution in across a network, I mean, it's, it's truly wide open. And I think here in Hawaii, I think, I don't know, working with some folks, of course, I mean, uh, I, it would be great to develop this system as the model system for eco-evolutionary dynamics, right? And I mean, I, there has been some empirical work, but I mean, from what I've seen, it's, you know, yeast on like little, <laughs> little systems of glass. So, I mean, this could be a really cool opportunity um, just to push forward, to push forward the theory, but then make sure we have each piece right as well. Um, and of course, spatial scales are really important here. So these have been across entire regions, but just points to the need to understand dispersal scales and scales of adaptation. Um, the model, as I've shown you, produces, you know, you can have both local adaptation as well as signals of gene swapping. And I think it would be really cool to try to, to match up those predictions and where, and basically to find where the model works well, but also to find where it completely breaks down. So yeah, so yeah, thank you very much everyone. And I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you so much, Lisa. Thank you. And uh, I will see if I can see any questions in the chat here. Okay, I can also stop sharing.